Uh, again, we greetings. We're delighted to be joined by Cesar Nunez, the director of the UNAIDS office here in New York, who's here to present you uh, the launch of the um, latest UNAIDS report. So, Cesar, please, you have the floor, and then we'll take some questions. Thank you so much, Stefan, and thank you all for being here um, once more. We have in the back uh, copies of the press release and the fact sheet that uh, may be useful uh, for you. As some of you may be aware, uh, the International AIDS Conference that is held every two years uh, is being launched tonight in, New in um, Germany, Munich, with uh, Chancellor Scholz as a keynote speaker. UNAIDS took uh, the opportunity to launch our 2024 uh, Global AIDS update um, earlier today. And uh, in, in that report, we provide some, some updates on, on the statistics uh, around the world regarding the achievement from member states in the last uh, year. Those achievements include, for instance, that at the end of December 2023, 30.7 million people were accessing antiretroviral uh, treatment. That is 7.7 million uh, up from 2010, but still short of the 34 million target that we have for 2025. In terms of new infections, um, they have been reduced by 60% since the peak in, 1990, in 1995. And in 2023, 1.3 million people were newly infected with HIV compared to 3.3 million in 1995. So that's a, a significant, as I said, reduction, 60%. Because of uh, uh, advances in treatment and, and the reductions of new infections, of course, um, we also have a reduction in the number of deaths. In 2023, around 630 people died from AIDS-related illnesses, illnesses worldwide compared to 2.1 million back in 2004 and 1.3 million in 2010. The target for 2025 is fewer than 250%. The last statistics that I will refer to, and then I'll go into some messages that we are delivering in the report, deals with uh, investments. At the end of 2023, uh, 19.8 billion, this is in constant 2019 US dollars, was available for the AIDS response in low and middle income countries. That's about 60% of those uh, coming from uh, domestic resources. So funding for HIV dropped by 5% from 2022 to 2023 and by 7.9% between 2020 and 2023. And that is one of the challenges that I will make, make references to. So a vehicle for you, but... Sorry. Okay. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, we'll call, uh, 10 minutes. Uh, looks like... Um, someone forgot. Yes. Someone is ordering yeah, bagels. Go, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> bagels for everyone. Yeah. So what I was saying is uh, the HIV response is far from over. And even if the world succeeds in ending AIDS as a public health threat by 2030, over 30 million people will be living with HIV in 2050. This is something we do not always think about. You know, people who are already living with HIV that will require treatment because the current th therapy uh, keeps them alive. So good news. Uh, in, in general, you may recall that during the launch of the 2024 SDG report here with the Secretary General and USG Lee, uh, he talked about 17% of implementation of the SDGs, but he also referred to SDG 3.3 as a glimmer of hope. I have shown you some of that hope in the figures that I've listed, but again, the world is not on track. Global new HIV infections uh, in, our, in our report uh, are shown as not declining fast enough, and in three regions of, of the world in particular, infections are rising, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, the Middle East and North Africa, and Latin America. Um, failure to end AIDS would lead to millions of preventable deaths and endanger the health and security of all. Our report, as I was saying, makes a call for three specific actions. Number one, resource the response. I already mentioned the gap in the amount of resources that are needed. Um, there, are, there have been continued cuts. A widening funding gap is holding back the HIV response, particularly in low and middle income countries. And, and the widening funding gap is holding back the HIV response there. Uh, again, $9.5 billion short each year compared to the expectations. 
We believe that uh, part of that, it's uh, uh, that we need to tackle the debt crisis. Countries are not investing enough in health on, on education because they need to address uh, the health crisis. Half of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa are either in debt distress or at high risk of it, spending on average three times more on repaying debt services than they do on health. For instance, in Angola, Kenya, Malawi, Rwanda, Uganda, and Zambia, debt servicing exceeds 50% of government, government revenues. So I emphasize here the need for restructuring the financial system. This is a message that you have heard from all the colleagues in the room and, of course, by, from the Secretary General himself. We need to close the funding gap for HIV treatment and prevention. And, of course, uh, underscore the, the country's uh, need to concentrate resources on, on these. We feel that, uh, and you were discussing just about that a few minutes ago, the, the impact of conflict. Uh, on service delivery and the importance of addressing the needs of displaced populations. We have conflicts in, in all continents of the world. We have displaced people in need, of course, of, of food, of clothing and, and housing, but medication, particularly those who are living with HIV. The political panorama in terms of uh, uh, 65 countries, I believe that it was mentioned here sometime in the back, 65 electoral processes taking place in 2024. For us, we feel that we must remain strong with the political commitments and underscore the importance of maintaining the gains in HIV treatment and prevention amidst the changing of governments. We'll see how we do on, along those lines. The second message. Get long at the treatment and prevention options to all low and middle income countries. I wonder how many um, of you are aware of the, a new product that is called Lena Kappa beer. This is an injectable. Some of you may recall when people living with HIV had to take so many pills a day to stay alive. I believe last year I was still referring to you to a triple therapy in one pill. Well, now we have an injectable every six months. Can you imagine that? You take a shot in January, you take another shot in July, and that's it. So innovation is good, but at what cost? We're going back to when we started with the free, uh, first uh, antiretroviral uh, medications that were so expensive that were not accessible worldwide. Now, access to these long-acting prevention and treatment would be a game-changing breakthrough. Now we're talking about what is a game-changer. This would be a game-changer uh, in the world. This could transform access to poor people, to uh, people from the key populations, gay men, sex workers, and, and, and young women and girls in Africa who could be freed from the stigma and discrimination or fear of being attacked uh, for being seen having the medicine, uh, taking medicine every day. Again, the price is just too high and accessible uh, mostly in, in high-income countries. Third message. Tackle the discrimination and stigma that are pushing the most marginalized people away from health care. Some of you may have noticed the surge in the promotion of anti-rights, anti-gender, and uh, uh, even criminalization of some populations uh, in, in different countries uh, around the world. This is something that, that has to stop. We, people are not able to come to, to be tested. People are not able to come and, and collect their treatment or care services. Uh, and, and of course, this, this actually uh, prevents the response to move forward. We need to save lives, and the countries need to decriminalize. At the, at, and end the discrimination, decriminalization faced by girls and women that is driving the AIDS pandemic, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, where 3,200 young girls, adolescent girls, are infected every week. So that my last point, and, and it's not necessarily in the, in the report, has to do with you, those of you sitting here or um, listening in. The role of media. I think it's important that I acknowledge the critical role that you play in keeping the HIV issues, uh, uh, you know, top of mind. Uh, and I, I really appreciate that you stayed for this briefing, and hopefully uh, the messages that I that are that I have expressed or that are in the press release will be amplified through your your media. Uh, I know that there is a lot going on in the world, public crisis, 
But we also need good news, and we also need to, to send out those, these messages that, that uh, you know, uh, call on the member states, on the, on, the, on the leaders of the world, to take the path of solidarity. We have said in the past that uh, the path to end AIDS is well known. And, and that em encompasses uh, commitment, political commitment that comes with budgets. Otherwise, it's demagogy. If leaders take the path of solidarity, their legacy will be preventing millions of new infections, saving millions of lives, ensuring healthy and full lives for everyone living with HIV, and keeping all of us safe. We look forward to addressing this at the Summit of the Future next September and see um, how we can take it from there. Let me stop here. Thank you, Stefan. Thank Thank you very much, Cesar. Uh, Edie? Uh, thank you very much, Cesar. On behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association for doing this briefing, my name is Edith Lederer from the Associated Press. Um, before I ask my question, in the beginning you were talking about deaths, and I believe you said 600, 630. Is it 630 or 630,000 630, worldwide. I think the thousand. Maybe I skipped the thousand. You skipped the thousand. You were listening. Yeah, I, I was, was just listening. checking. He always listens. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, secondly, um, on the injectable. Yes, ma'am. Um, are any negotiations going on to bring down the prices? And can you give us an update on? what's happening with research on vaccines. Thank you. Thank you, Edith. Can please I go? go ahead. No, please. Yeah, um, actually, uh, UNAIDS, it's, it's uh, constantly and insistently advocating with the, the manufacturer of this particular drug because res the research is magnificent. It's, it's, this is a, a very important, very good drug. Uh, and we are asking them to please consider making it available at a lower price to low and middle income countries. The issue here is that most of the people living with HIV live in middle income or upper middle income countries, but that doesn't mean that they are rich. They're usually very poor, but that's where they live. Um, so UNH is making that ask. Please announce a reduced price for uh, countries to, that need to be able to access it. And, and, and that is something that we will continue um, advocating for. Vaccines. Um, since I've started working in HIV more than 30 years ago, I always listen to, you know, a projection of 10 more years before we find uh, a vaccine. I believe that the, the work that was done um, during COVID which was something that we have heard uh, was, was, was happening already, uh, is an, another route that is being taken now by researchers uh, uh, looking at an HIV vaccine. Um, I believe that even uh, this new injectable is, is sort of going in that direction, because twice a year, that gives a, a lot of flexibility to people. So looking forward to the outcome of uh, current research on vaccine, and, and, and hopefully by the next time I'm here, I'll be able to bring you a more positive answer. And just for those of us who don't follow this, what's the cost of an injectable for six months? For one year, it's $40,000. One four? Four zero. $40,000. 40. I'm looking at my colleagues in the back, but I believe it's correct. Four zero. Four $40,000 a year. Do you remember back in the days when everything was starting? It was supposed, it was $10,000 per person per year. So, uh, Dollars value has yeah. changed, but uh, four zero. It's it's, it's a look at uh, the, the treatment for Hep C. It's ninety five thousand dollars per person. You do get cured, but it's a thousand dollars a pill. Tony, <laughs> thank you, uh, Tony Nadaf Al Hurra TV. So I'm gonna start with you from here. The last remark regarding the uh, forty thousand dollars, and we, we, I'm gonna take you to the low income countries, yes. where people are still unable to access, like even the uh, preemptive uh, treatment. Yes. What is the UN AIDS doing these days to 
change this reality? That's my first question. And then I want to ask you about the, you mentioned like three areas, three regions, actually, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, the Middle East, and North Africa, and Latin American countries as, uh, sorry, uh, witnessing a rise in infection. Would you be able to share more about the cause of this uh, rise? And if you have any specific uh, numbers in terms of death or even infections in the Middle East and North Africa precisely? Absolutely. Uh, without going into all of the numbers, I can tell you that all of the figures are in the, in the press release. But if you need specific you know, regional data, we, we can definitely provide it. Um, in UNAs, we're always working with uh, access to medicines. And uh, there is a program uh, that is run by the United Nations, WHO, it's Pat and Pool, and, and we, we work with, uh, with them to make sure that uh, med medications are available to people. Our most significant uh, achievement, I believe, uh, uh, has been with Dolutegravir. It's one medication that uh, is being made available to low-income countries, and at the moment, if, you, if we leave the injectables aside for one moment, you can, a, a public health system can procure the Lutegraver for about $75 per person per year. This is what has allowed many countries to increase the number of people in treatment. Unfortunately, that's, there's still about 10 million that, that, that have, have not started treatment. And we're going to continue uh, looking for uh, opportunities to, to make sure that the accessibility in terms of pricing is there. There are partners that uh, are also in the field, the, the United States Presidential Project PEPFAR. They, they actually provide this kind of therapy to, to countries around the world. We also assist countries in, uh, in implementation of the World Trade Organization TRIPS flexibilities. Uh, Colombia has been one of the countries that most recently uh, uh, exercised uh, their right to, to have access to the Lutegra very precisely. And now they do because it was incredibly expensive for them to buy. Now, regarding the, the increase of uh, new infections in these three regions, particularly in uh, Eastern Europe and, and Central Asia, 93% of the new infections in, in these countries are happening in... Russia, Ukraine, Uzbekistan, and Kazakhstan. Eight out of 13 countries in the region reported increases in new infections. So because stigma, discrimination, harm all punitive laws of struck marginalized communities access to vital services. All right? So 94% of the new infections were among people from key populations, including men who have sex with men, people who inject drugs, and sex workers, and the sexual partners of people from the key populations. So this is something that, that is specific of uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Latin America, which is a region that I'm, I'm more familiar with, has had difficulties in uh, education, se uh, comprehensive sexuality education. And uh, it seems like the, the, the guard has been brought down in terms of prevention. Prevention has dropped a lot. It seems like we have focused a lot more on treatment and we have left prevention on the side. We need to scale up prevention in most cases of the regions where uh, uh, new infections are coming up. And the Middle East, any reason why, any about the factors behind the rise? Uh, well, the, the issue of stigma and discrimination has always been there. Um, and uh, it's uh, perhaps in terms of absolute numbers, it's not that big or large a number, but uh, it does represent an increase for so far. But again, the, the, the specific numbers after, we can provide to you uh, with, with, with pleasure. Gabriel? Thank you for the briefing. My name is Gabriel Isondo from Al Jazeera. Uh, I have, um, Edie asked a lot of my questions about the <laughs> injectable, um, but I'll just follow up. I find it fascinating. Is the, um, you say you're talking to, UNAIDS is talking to the manufacturer about trying to bring the pr price down. What has been their response so far? We're, they're talking about it, they're discussing. I know that, uh, you know, to, to be fair, there is already an agreed uh, price for low-income countries. And there's always been a list of low-income countries uh, that, have, that do benefit from uh, a lower price. However, 
as I mentioned, it is middle income and upper middle income countries where most people living with HIV reside. And that's where, uh, and these are the countries that I was referring earlier, are having challenges with repaying debt. But just by servicing the debt, they have not enough money to cover for health expenditure soon. And, and $40,000 is a lot of money. Yeah. So, so they would, I'm not saying that, that st staying with the Lutegravir at $75 a year per, per, per person is not good. I mean, it's, it's actually desirable. Obviously, as we move, an innovation helps us take the, the, nep leap, the next leap or the next pivot, it's a direction that we would like the whole world to take. And um, is the injectable better? There's, there's the pills and there's the injectable, right? Yeah. Is the injectable better treatment or is it just a more convenient treatment? It's both uh, 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 good, effective, if I should say that, and uh, convenient. As I was saying, some people uh, have challenges still uh, coming to a health service. Uh, stigma, discrimination, why are you taking that, and so on. So by, by coming just twice a year, that, that would take care of, of that. Thank you. Uh, no other questions? Thank you so much for coming, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Steph.